For this part, we're going to cover the uh, landscape features. The objective here, of course, is to uh, look at position, uh, parent material, some of those key characteristics that help us to differentiate different soil series. When we get into the soil survey and you're looking at interpretations, you, you work with soil series. Well, the basis behind those series are some of these key landscape features. First is position on the landscape. Of course, the choices on your scorecard are upland, upland depression or drainage way, terrace, or floodplain positions. Each of those positions would dictate a different name of soil series, like Sassafras or Mattapique or Hagerstown, as we move across different series across the state. How are you going to make that determination about where you are? You need to have a sense of the landscape that you're on, so you need to look around, but primarily you need to concentrate on the, the area that you're looking at to judge along with the soil pit. And in this particular uh, situation, it represents an area that represents a, a very large portion of the state, which is actually upland. So on the scorecard for this particular site, you would want to check upland. A good way to approach your decision out there is to first start at the bottom of these choices, start with wetter features such as floodplain. How do you know if it's a floodplain? The bottom line is the proctor will have an information sign at the pit that gives you a flooding frequency. If we give you a flooding frequency of rare, occasional, or frequent, you automatically know that it's a floodplain and you would expect to see relatively recent uh, alluvial soils in, in the soil pit. If you move upward from a major stream course from what is a floodplain to a second bottom or a second level, that in this day and age no longer floods, that represents the terrace position. Typically these terrace positions would have very well developed profiles, have a nice A, nice B, C. Commonly these soils would have the old alluvium uh, type parent material. Other than upland is the upland depression or drainage way. And essentially what we're talking about are the closed depressions that we typically have on the coastal plain uh, particularly on the eastern shore where water drains toward an area from four different directions. Commonly they pond water for short periods of time. The other option is in the Piedmont and the Appalachian region essentially we're talking about heads of drainage ways where you could anticipate water coming toward you from three different directions. So as a consequence both of those would induce a wetness issue whether it be surface runoff or whether it be substratum water in that profile. For this particular site, basically we can rule out floodplain, we can rule out terrace, we can rule out an upland depression or drainage way. That leaves us with upland. The second item, of course, is parent material. Uh, that has a, a paramount effect on the soil series that we select. And the parent materials that we identify here are residual, colluvium, recent alluvium, old alluvium, or coastal plain sediments. Certainly here today in Anne Arundel County on Goshen Farm, we're on coastal plain sediments. The unconsolidated sediments that in the geologic past were, were deposited, and so that's what the soil has formed in. The residual refers to the residual material resulting from the weathering of uh, the various rock types across the state. In the Piedmont, we've got the igneous and metamorphic rocks that give rise to certain kinds of soils. And then in the Appalachian region, we've got the sedimentary rocks that gives us uh, basically limestone, sandstone, shale, and those kind of parent materials. The other one that we often run into are colluvial materials. The colluvial materials are those that have moved downslope principally by gravity with some influence of water moving over the, the existing land typically in the lower parts of the landscape. We encounter a lot of these kind of soils uh, particularly up in the Appalachian region and somewhat uh, in the Piedmont as well. Look at the soil profile in the pit and you look at the rock fragment you'll find different kinds of rock fragment. 
It could be fragments of shale, fragments of sandstone intermixed. Those rock fragments will be disoriented. Some might be standing vertical, some might be oblique, some might be lying flat, as opposed to residual soils where the bedrock is typically very oriented. It could be lateral, could be standing vertical in different forms, but the distinction is that with colluvium, it's material that's disoriented, and commonly those rock fragments are semi-rounded uh, on the edges. Recent alluvium, referring back to the very young soils that occurs on our floodplain position, we would ask that that be identified if the young materials that have been added through deposition representing A and C horizon soils exceed 20 inches in depth. Old alluvium, again, that's the material that we would find on terrace positions. The distinction there is that's material that was one time a floodplain. Rock material was laid down and the, the rock fragment in terrace material is well-rounded water-worn material in a matrix of soil. And the distinction is that on terraces, the profiles are very, very well developed, have striking B horizons, sea horizons. That leaves us with the coastal plain sediments, unconsolidated sediments. The third one are the uh, slope characteristics. We're getting at those criteria that we use to identify uh, map units, uh, a breakdown of soil series, <clears throat> and we identify the slope as being a very significant factor in all of our interpretations and use and management, both in agriculture and in the urban interpretations. For slope characteristics at an Envirothon site, we always set uh, two stakes for you to use to make your slope determination. Uh, using the clinometer, we have a video uh, showing the details of how we do that. We have a stake here and one down here at the bottom of the hill. What you're looking for is to determine the number of feet of rise in a certain distance, in 100 feet. It is important to document the actual percent slope that you determine on your clinometer. You may need that to handle some of our interpretations. The first break that you need to make though is to place the slope into a mapping unit slope class, which are shown on your scorecard, nearly level, gently sloping, down through very steep. The key to remember is if you're in the coastal plain region, the slope breaks are different, slightly different, than they are in the Appalachian and Piedmont region. At this particular site, we measured the slope. You would want to check strongly sloping because it falls in the 5 to 10 percent uh, category. The other element that uh, influences the uh, kind of map unit that would be published on the uh, soil survey report is surface stoniness or rockiness. What we're talking about there is whether the surface is very stony, and when we're talking about stones, we're talking about rock fragment that exceeds 10 inches in diameter, as opposed to the rock outcrop, which are bedrock material that's exposed that either through erosion or hasn't weathered to the point that it's permanently connected to the ground, and it's not something that you can pick up and move as you would with a stone. Uh, the criteria being, if you have rock fragment objects that were, are within 30 feet of each other, uh, greater than 10 inches apart, then we would call that very stony. If these rock outcrops that we're talking about, typically uh, they're oriented in one direction or another and kind of in parallel, thinking primarily of, of limestone regions, and some of the marble regions in the state, we would expect to find those exposures within every 100 feet. Generally speaking, in envirothons, we help the student out a little bit by flagging some of those bedrock uh, outcrops so that as you walk around the site, you'll be able to identify those. Mm -hmm.